In this video, we're going to talk about intercultural negotiations. The negotiations that we're going to talk about are specific to business settings, but also know that you negotiate in all of your relationships, whether they're interpersonal, intercultural, combination of both. So that what you learn about negotiation today is transferable into your other relationships. We're just going to talk about them in a strictly business sense. One of the reasons why intercultural negotiation is so difficult to accomplish is because we're so used to negotiating within our own culture that we assume that the rules um, that we use to understand how we ought to negotiate and how we ought to achieve our goals are going to be the same when we go into new contexts. And so we kind of imagine that this negotiation process is going to look very similar to what we're used to when in fact it's not. Okay, when we negotiate in our own culture, we know the values of the other person or we have an, a better idea of what goals they have about the interaction and um, what ethical choices that they're going to make um, simply because we have a better idea of what their cultural background looks like. So we know that there's all sorts of variation and we all have different lived experiences so we do all see the world in, in different ways. It's not all exactly the same. But when we try to understand a cultural the cultural lens of someone who's more similar to us, the process is a bit easier. So um, we're not guaranteed any shared perspectives when we, when we negotiate interculturally. So it's, it's a bit more difficult to find those places where our experiences and the experiences of the person that we're talking to overlap. And it's when we find those moments of overlap that we're able to have more effective communication because we recognize that we can both understand the worldview of the other person when we talk about those shared experiences. Other important things to consider when negotiating intercultural um, or in intercultural settings is that you might be writing a contract that's going to be enforced by two different legal systems. So um, if the two different legal systems are vastly different, that contract may mean very different things depending on which country or which part of the world it's being enforced in. So you want to be aware of that. And we also want to be aware that while the government in the U.S. tends to be very separate from business interactions, and they're not necessarily in the boardroom 24-7, that's not necessarily true of other countries. So you might have government officials that you have to be interacting with. Um, you also might be negotiating in a country that's politically unstable, so things can change really quickly. These are all important things to consider when looking at intercultural negotiations. So it's, it's important to remember that it is about um, being an effective intercultural negotiator is about much more than just knowing the values and the beliefs of the group that you're interacting with. Because we do a lot of negotiating every day, we kind of have this idea that we know what it is and we intuitively know how to accomplish it. We don't necessarily spend the time thinking about what the definition means. So to help us better understand and at least be on the same page concerning what a negotiation is, it's important to know that negotiations are the interaction of two or more parties who both have common and conflicting interests for the purpose of reaching a mutually beneficial agreement. So negotiations happen when we need to work together, but we have different ideas about how we should um, achieve those joint goals that we have. We engage in negotiation in our everyday lives. All of the time we're engaging in negotiations. So um, you might have a negotiation with your significant other when you're trying to decide where you want to go for dinner. So you both have a common interest in eating a meal, but you have conflicting ideas about where you ought to go to eat out. When your significant other offers to do the laundry, if you pick his or her suggestion, you have to decide if receiving laundry for giving in on the dinner choice is beneficial to you. If it is, you can make this agreement. And if it's not, you continue the negotiations and you decide what you're going to offer to sweeten the pot so that he or she will pick the place that you want to go. What then does it take to be a good negotiator? Well, first, good negotiators have strong persuasion skills. So individuals that are highly persuasive know um, many different strategies for persuading other people and they're able to effectively analyze the situation so that they can pick the strategies that are likely to be most um, to be most effective in a specific context. Good negotiators are also well prepared so they know what outcome they want, what outcome their company wants, what they can concede, when they can concede those things, and finally they know what to expect within the intercultural negotiation setting. 
all of this requires doing your homework. Not just on the deal that needs to be made though. You have to do your homework about the culture um, with which you're making that deal. So you need to learn about the people you're making that deal with, not just about what you need to do to get this deal to go through. While good negotiators are well prepared, they're also flexible and creative when things don't go as planned. So a good intercultural negotiator is aware of the fact that the cultural differences between the individuals involved in the negotiation are likely to cause problems. Thus, he or she is flexible and finds creative solutions when their well-planned preparations don't really, um, don't really work out, so they become irrelevant to the negotiation process. When that happens, um, strong negotiators are both flexible and creative and can find new ways of interacting with the other, um, the other person and, and trying to achieve their goals. Finally, good negotiators need to have patience. Things are not going to go as planned. That doesn't mean you shouldn't have a plan. That just means you need to be ready to patiently work through things with your intercultural co-negotiators. As I've said, negotiation can be stressful when individuals are coming to negotiation from the same cultural background. So again, you can only imagine how stressful things can get when individuals are coming from different backgrounds with different perspectives. So know that intercultural negotiation can be time consuming and as such, it, it requires people to really be patient and to be willing to work through the process of negotiating and coming to some type of uh, mutual resolution to a problem. So now that we know the personal characteristics that a good negotiator should have, it's important to learn about some of the strategies that we can utilize um, to become more effective negotiators. First, to be an effective negotiator, we have to remember to do our homework. So we have to learn as much as we possibly can about the other national culture and um, the other organizational culture, as well as the other culture of the individual. Right, so if we fully want to be able to understand um, how to come up with good strategies for achieving our goals, we have to know all of information about all of those different things so we can truly understand who we're sending that message to and how we can make that message most persuasive. Second, you're going to want to focus on relationships and building relationships rather than just getting contracts signed. So many times, because we're U.S. Americans, we focus on getting a project completed on time and under budget. Right? Time is money, and if we can get things done quickly and for less money than we thought we did, or we would, we've won. We've accomplished a goal. That being said, many other cultures see negotiation um, not as getting a contract signed, but as building a long-term relationship with an individual from another organization. So recognizing this focus that other organizations have on um, building relationships, it's important for U.S. American negotiators to remember that there are benefits to creating those long-standing business relationships. And if they come into situations with a bit more flexibility and a bit more um, willingness to concede on their desire to have a contract signed now and to be enforced 100% the way the contract is written, they might be able to um, facilitate some of those good feelings that enable intercultural relationships to happen and to flourish. One of the things we have to do when we build relationships, however, is meet with individuals face to face. So when building relationships um, interculturally, you might need to travel to that culture to have those meetings. It's not going to be enough to necessarily set up a Skype interaction or do some type of um, meeting software where you all can join together at the same time. So you're going to need to meet face to face. When you do that, you're going to get to eat together, drink together, um, do activities together. So maybe they're going to take you to play golf or to do another activity that's important to them within their culture. So while a lot of U.S. Americans don't necessarily value doing these things in business settings, again, time is money and building relationships takes time and focus away from the business at hand, um, do recognize that doing this is important as it enables us to engage in dialogue with the other group of people and this can help us facilitate a relationship with that individual. Good negotiators also consider the need that exists behind the position that the other side is advocating for. Right? And this requires you to try and understand why the co-negotiator or your co-negotiator is asking for what they're asking for. In the end, we have to remember that like the iceberg, there are always things that we can't see. There are always rationales for what people are doing that we don't necessarily see. 
Those things exist under the surface, and they're not clearly visible to us at all times, but we can explore them so that we can fully understand why people think and do the things that they do. We also want to be sure that we're not relying too much on intercultural stereotypes when we're learning how to do our homework. So when we're good intercultural negotiators who do our homework and we try and learn who the person we're negotiating with is, and the problem we can have is sometimes we're over-reliant on um, what the books say that person ought to be, and we don't really let that person be an individual. So it's important to know how people from that culture tend to behave, but you want to get into that interaction and then rather quickly let that person change those stereotypes. So you don't want to rely on what the book said or how the book said a, an individual from the Japanese culture would approach a negotiation situation. You want to allow that individual to let you learn how they approach negotiation situations. So having that context in the background of your mind is important because it's going to help you understand why they see negotiation settings the way they do. But you do want to let a person become an individual rather than keeping them as a cultural stereotype. In intercultural negotiation, we also want to be sensitive to timing. So as we learned earlier, individuals have different time orientations, and this can make negotiations difficult if one person has that monochronic orientation and assumes that time is money, and the other person um, has a more polychronic orientation and is really focused on building relationships. Because in the U.S. we expect things to be done really quickly, it's important as U.S. individuals that we are willing and able to adjust our expectations for when work will get done when we're working internationally. A lot of times inter international negotiations can take a really long time and so walking in with the expectation that this is going to be something quick and easy to accomplish is likely not going to happen. So this is going to be one area where you should probably adjust those expectations from the beginning so that you can be more successful. So if you tend to be a fast worker, um, it would be advantageous for you to pay attention to how your co-negotiators orient to time when you arrive in an international setting so that you can work to adjust your communication to their expectations for how long this will take. Being patient in inter international business and international negotiation situations is a virtue. You also want to consider um, the time of year when you're looking and being sensitive to timing. So in the U.S., not a lot of work gets done on the week between um, the Christmas holiday and New Year's. So in intercultural settings, that really wouldn't be a good time for other individuals to suggest that, um, that a meeting happen or that negotiations take place. The final thing you want to remember if you're being sensitive to timing is that time zones might come into play if you're not meeting face-to-face -face, or even if you're meeting face-to-face -face, as someone might be jet-lagged or have just re um, just arrived in a new time zone. Effective intercultural communicators are also flexible. Um, because we have a high focus on the importance of time in the United States and we really want to accomplish things quickly and efficiently, um, we tend to like to plan things out. So we have a plan for how things ought to happen. And when things don't go to plan because schedules change or governments get involved or people don't do what they promise, it's important that we remain flexible and open to changing the way that we get our work done. When negotiating internationally, we're going to undoubtedly find ourselves in unfamiliar situations. And so we can freak out and we can panic and we can lose in the negotiation. Or we can, again, try and remember that we need to stay flexible, be open to the different things that are happening us, to us and trying to understand why those things are occurring. So really, um, being flexible involves kind of going with the flow and not allowing the cultural differences that are occur occurring within the meeting to throw you for too much of a loop. You also want to learn how to listen. So U.S. American speakers tend to be very direct and aggressive. Right? We value directness and we value competition in this country. So when we converse with other people, we try and win in those conversations. And you win by being able to get your message across to the other person in a very clear and concise way. As such, um, we're taught that talking is what's important and paying attention to message production is what's important. And we don't necessarily focus as much on teaching individuals how to be good listeners. So a lot of the cognitive effort we spend in conversation focuses on constructing messages rather than interpreting messages. If you learn to actively listen, however, and you try and understand your co-negotiator when you're in interaction with him or her, 
you might find yourself better able to secure the things that your organization wants um, because through listening you've learned about the issues and um, you're able to convince the other people that you're talking with that you fully understand where things are headed or where what their perspective is so you can get them to be more flexible because you can show that you understand what they're advocating for and you you've seen what's below the water on that iceberg right you get why they're saying what they're saying why they want the things that they want also you can convince them that you're trustworthy and worthy of entering into a long-term relationship with um, when you pay attention to listening and listening to what they're saying so just some strategies you can use to become a better listener. Working to hear all messages and not just the ones that you agree with. Sometimes when we are listening, we dismiss the things that we um, don't believe or we don't agree with as unimportant. We call this cognitive dissonance. So if something um, doesn't align with how we look at the world, we don't really pay attention to that portion of the message. So we don't want to do that in intercultural business settings because um, we want to hear all those messages because likely a lot of things that are shared aren't going to align with how we see the world. We also want to learn to listen to the whole message before we provide a response. So as US Americans we like to help other people solve problems and a consequence of this is that sometimes we don't let them share their full perspective before we interject. So good listeners let their conversational partners share everything and then they um, interject with their, with their advice or with their commentary. So let the other person give their full message before you start talking. You also want to focus on the message and not the presentation of that message. So presentation is important to how a message is perceived and how um, effective a message is, but it's far more important to focus on what's being said rather than um, the number of times an individual said um or ah while delivering that message or um, the lack of an effective PowerPoint that coincided with the message, right? Focusing on those things takes your cognitive energy away from trying to understand what that message is. So it's far more beneficial for you to just focus on the message and not how that message comes to you. You also want to make sure you're asking open-ended questions so that the speaker is able to elaborate and really share their um, perspective on things or their position on things. Likewise, you want to stay in the moment. A lot of times when we're listening, our minds can wander and go elsewhere. And so you really want to use cognitive effort to try and stay in the moment and try and understand um, what's being said and why those things are important. As a good listener, you might ask that a colleague come along with you um, to help you listen to what's going on. So this is going to ensure that more than one person is listening to what's happening. And then through dialogue, um, the two of you can come to better understand what actually happened in the interaction. So if you happen to miss something, maybe he or she picked up on it, or maybe through discussion you can come to understand the motivation that was behind some of those messages um, in different ways than you would have if you were the only person listening to them. Finally, active listeners take notes. So you don't take notes by writing down every single thing that a person's saying. Rather, you take notes by writing down those things that are important. If you have good note-taking skills, um, you can better distinguish between what's important and unimportant in a conversation, and then you have a good record of the things that you need to pay attention to. Likewise, as your conversational partner sees you writing things down, that's again going to show care and concern about the relationship that's going to build trust and hopefully enable more open communication between all parties. I've said this many times, but to be effective um, in negotiation in intercultural situations, you have to learn about your own culture as well as the culture that you're visiting. There is, however, another culture that you should pay attention to. So you also want to pay attention to the views that your co-negotiator has about your culture, right? You want to consider how that person perceives you. You want to consider how that person perceives you so that you can better understand how to interpret the messages that they're sending your way. Finally, strong intercultural negotiators act ethically and with integrity so that they can build trusting relationships. They accept that multinational connections are needed to be successful in a global market, and they work to be trustworthy so that their relationships can grow. All right, so this video um, gave a detailed look at how to become a better intercultural negotiator. These skills are going to be useful to consider when you work on the cross-cultural negotiation activity on Monday.